In this session we're going to look at International Accounting Standard 18 uh, which covers revenue. We're going to look at what the definition of revenue is. We'll also look at when we should record revenue in our accounts for um, the sale of goods and the provision of services and we'll also look at when we should re um, record dividends receivable in our accounts. So let's start by considering what revenue is. Now IAS 18 provides us with a formal definition. They say it's the um, gross inflow of economic benefits during the period arising in the course of ordinary activities of an entity when those inflows result in increases in equity other than increases relating to contributions from equity participants. That's quite a tough definition certainly to remember and so we're going to think about what it means in practice. Well first of all the formal definition talks about gross inflows of economic benefits. What we mean there is that we've received an asset. Now the asset might be money, so we've supplied some goods and we've received some money for it. Or it might be a promise on behalf of a customer to pay at a later date, in which case the asset that we've received is a debtor or a, um, a receivable. The second part of our formal definition is um, uh, considers where that asset that we've acquired has actually come from. And in the majority of cases it's going to come from either the sale of goods, so I've exchanged an item of inventory for some money, or from the supply of services, so I have provided a service and now I expect to be paid for it. The point is, is that it has come about due to the businesses or the company's ordinary day-to-day -day activities. It has not come from the shareholders which are referred to as equity participants. They haven't put any extra investment into the company. So when we think about our um, the money that we've acquired and the sale of goods, that transaction is going to affect our profits. And that's what revenue is. Our second question is, how do we measure revenue? Well, revenue should be measured at the fair value of the consideration received. So um, when we're talking about fair value, this is the amount um, for which an asset could be exchanged for by knowledgeable willing parties in an arm's length transaction. So um, in the majority of cases this is the market value and most businesses will supply their services or goods at what they consider to be market value. Our third question is when do we record revenue or when do we recognize that revenue has arisen? Um, it's not always clear and, and let's think about three different scenarios to illustrate that um, it can be a little bit complicated. So first of all let's consider a company that's paid um, a deposit by a, company, a customer for some goods. So we might think, well, should I treat that deposit as revenue or not? A second scenario might be where we have issued an invoice for some goods before a year end, but the goods were actually delivered to the customer after the year end. So again, should we record that um, amount as revenue in our year end accounts? Well, both of those you might think, well, I think I can uh, come up with an argument to say that no, neither of those should be treated as revenue. But how about our third scenario? Here a company is, has been contracted to build a shopping centre. 
It's done half of the work and it's been paid a third of the value of the total contract by um, its customer. So what amount, if any, should be treated as revenue? Hopefully you can see that that's quite tricky. Um, it's not entirely clear how much revenue we should record. So really, we need some rules to help guide us. And this is what IAS 18 provides. So first of all, let's look at um, when we should recognize revenue from the sale of goods. And this is when five conditions are met. The first condition is that the significant risks and benefits have been transferred from the company to the buyer. Now in practice what this is talking about is that the customer now gains the benefit of owning those goods. So they can either use them for their own enjoyment or um, they can sell them on and any sale they will gain the profit that they make on that sale. Um, similarly, they will also incur any costs associated with owning these goods. So that might be um, costs, say, of insuring or storing the goods. Our second condition is that the company no longer has managerial involvement or control of the goods sold. So what we're talking about here is that the customer has now has possession of these goods and they can treat them as they want. Our third condition is that the amount of revenue can be determined reliably. So we know what the goods have been sold for. The fourth condition is similar to this one. It's uh, here though we're focusing on the costs associated with the transaction can be measured reliably. So there might be um, commissions payable and uh, all sorts of discounts. Well, we need to know how much all of those costs will come to. And lastly, the uh, final condition is that it is probable that the economic benefits associated with the transaction will flow to the company. And essentially this is that the seller thinks that he or she is going to get paid for this sale. We'll now look at the conditions that need to be met for a company to recognize revenue from the provision or rendering of services. The first condition is that the amount of revenue can be determined reliably. So in practice this means that we know how much we're going to um, charge for the services given. Secondly, it's probable that the economic benefits associated with the transaction will flow to the company. Well, this in practice simply means that we think we're going to get paid for the, uh, the services that have been supplied. Thirdly, the costs associated with the transaction can be measured reliably. So if there are costs associated with this transaction, we should know how much those costs to be incurred will turn out to be. And lastly, the stage of completion of the transaction at the statement of financial position date can be measured reliably. So where at our year end date um, we have services that are part complete, we would need to have um, knowledge of the stage of completion and we'd need to have a right to be able to charge for that part completion. Now you'll notice that three of those four conditions are also um, conditions where we're talking about the sale of goods. So hopefully the fact that three of out of the f uh, four are duplicated should make it a little bit easier to remember them. Lastly, we're going to consider when we should recognize revenue from dividends. Um, 
So we're thinking about a situation where a company owns shares in another company and is due to receive some dividends from that other company. And we, re um, we recognize revenue um, when three conditions are met. First of all, the company has to have the right to receive the dividends in the first place. So in practice, this means that we, uh, we've got to uh, know that the shares were owned at the appropriate date to receive those dividends. Otherwise, you simply don't have the right to receive them. The second condition it is that it is probable that the dividend will be received. So there can't be any reason why uh, we believe that um, the company cannot or will not pay. The final condition is that the amount of the dividend to be received can be measured reliably. Now this should be relatively straightforward because the shareholder um, is typically told what the dividend rate is by the company in advance of um, any dividends. So that should be reasonably straightforward. And that tells us how we recognize revenue from dividends.